Hi guys. Sina is about to tell you about stateless Ethereum. Hey. Um, so this is Sina, and um, this will be kind of like a friendly reminder kind of talk. Um, I've been following the ETH1X and stateless conversation um, closely. And um, here I will mention a few, like I will first give an introduction or a very lightning intro to stateless Ethereum and what kind of changes we can probably expect and then how it could influence um, contract development. Like if you're designing uh, a smart contract, what should you have in mind? Um, like if you want to have it future-proof when stateless Ethereum hits. So um, you all know about the storage growth problem. Um, the, the two main issues for users is that the storage requirements for nodes are, uh, are quite high and that it takes very long to, to sync a node. Um, so these are the two goals that the stateless Ethereum is kind of, among other goals, uh, is targeting. Um, reduce storage requirements for at least some, some of the nodes and uh, hopefully improve uh, s like sync, uh, sync times, like block, block processing times. And the goal is to do it by um, introducing a new kind of client which is called a stateless client. And uh, these clients do not store the whole state, they only store parts of the state that they care about. And um, they, they depend on uh, miners um, who, um, who additionally, like, so miners right now, they just produce a block and then propagate it to the network. But then they would also um, produce uh, what we call block witnesses. So Merkle proofs. Um, so, so they say, okay, here's a block. Uh, this is all parts of the state that this uh, list of transaction needs. And these are all the Merkle proofs that's, uh, that uh, prove their validity. And, and they include these witnesses in the block so that stateless clients, when they receive the block and the witness, they can make sure uh, uh, that the, 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 these parts of the state are valid and they can run the transactions against them. And this is an example of a block witness. Um, and this is not a big block, like it's one of the smaller blocks. Um, you can see the tree structure, you can see those orange boxes, they are hashes. Uh, here, down here are the leaves. And this big thing is a contract code. So <clears throat> when you make a block witness, you need to send all of the accounts that are needed for, the, uh, for these transactions all of the storage items, uh, all of the contract codes. So you can assume that this will introduce a lot of uh, network overhead. And uh, here is um, like over a list of um, recent blocks, like from eight million something to, to nine million, um, how much these, these block witnesses, um, like what, what's their size? And this is an average, um, average over 128 blocks each point. So there can be like, we have blocks that have a uh, block witness of three megabytes, uh, but sometimes it's lower. So, so up there, the blue is the total. And then you have all the hashes that are necessary for the Merkle proofs. And then you have the, um, like, the orange one is the contract code that you have to send. And down here are the actual values. Uh, so, so you can see that the values are not much. It's mainly dominated by contract code and uh, proof hashes. So, so the, the key takeaway here is that when we switch to stateless Ethereum, then um, although no, some nodes won't need to store much, but the network overhead will increase by quite a lot. Um, and to, to make some optimization on the network overhead, there are some changes, um, like some possible changes being considered. Uh, one is to change the tree structure of Ethereum. Right now, you might know that uh, Ethereum uses um, a tree structure called Merkle Patricia tree, and it's a hexary tree. So each node has 16 children. Um, but as, as we saw, like uh, hexary trees have very large proofs. Um, so theoretically, we thought that 
switching to a binary tree could reduce the proof sizes by quite a lot. And uh, so far, uh, the my team from Tuberget team, Alexey Akhnov and the rest, they've done some experiments and, uh, and have shown that this is true. So we can reduce, um, like if, if you look at this chart here, you can reduce this, so the hashes, by three, uh, three times, uh, which, is, which is quite a lot. And after you do that, uh, the co a contract code will, will dominate the um, block witnesses. And so the next step is to do code miracleization. And I will talk about this in more detail in, at ETHCC, so if you're curious, check it out. Um, code miracle, the gist of code miracleization is that um, for, for, for one transaction, you don't, need to, you, don't, you don't need the whole contract code. Like if you want to transact with MakerDAO, you don't need the whole thing. Um, you just need one function, for example. Um, so here we, we break uh, contract code into chunks. Uh, make a tree out of it, and then for every transaction, we only send the parts that are necessary for executing it. And this, as we, sh uh, as uh, as I show in in the data, um, also reduces um, the the block witness size by by quite a bit. Um, and the next thing, so so up to here, there were optimizations that you don't really care about, like as a contract developer. But the the, the next three things affect you directly, and, and especially the next one. So <clears throat> because every time you do an S load or a balance or any of the opcodes that touch a part of the state, um, miners would have to include a Merkle proof for that. So this means that any state accessing opcode introduces now a lot of additional overhead, and it means that the gas prices would have to be increased. Um, uh, the other thing is that, um, as we saw recently, um, it's, it's very hard to predict what the actual gas cost of an opcode should be. Uh, and over the course of Ethereum's life, gas cost prices have changed uh, a few times. So something that's being considered, and, and this has led to breaking uh, some of the contracts, like with EIP, um, 1884, which broke some of the contracts. So, so the goal here with on gas is to disable contracts from observing gas in their contracts. So you wouldn't be able to know how much gas has been so far spent in this transaction and how much is left. Um, and the other one that is not directly related to stateless Ethereum, but it's kind of related, is chain pruning. This is a separate proposal. Uh, because, so um, again, full nodes, they have to store all of the blocks, all of the block headers from Genesis, from the first block of Ethereum, which is quite a lot of data. And um, like clients are now considering to remove, the, uh, remove it every once in a while. And this makes it difficult for new nodes to sync to the network. And you can expect that stateless clients probably won't keep this data anyway. And this has some consequence that I will tell you later about. So, um, so these are the changes that we can roughly expect. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's all in research phase. It, it's not at all clear, but um, it's, it's very probable. Now, um, I'm going to go deeper into um, the gas price changes of state accessing opcodes. Um, right now, you, you might know that uh, S-load, I think, costs 700 or 800. But um, Vitalik estimated that with stateless Ethereum, the price might have to increase to 2,000. And uh, similar, similarly, for balance and other output, it will have to increase to 2,400. This is to prevent um, some some, uh, some blocks that can basically DOS the network. Because you have to, for every, like, every time you do an S-load, we have to include a Merkle proof in the block, which introduces a lot of data. So we have to kind of price it in a way that um, we can target a maximum block size. Like, we don't want blocks to become 10 megabytes or 20 megabytes or something. We want to limit them to, let's say, 3 megabytes. So we have to price um, 
the state accessing opcodes in a way that uh, we can we can limit it as such. So this is one, this is one approach uh, uh, to to pricing uh, state accessing opcodes. The other approach is to price it based on the actual proof size that they they induce on the network. <clears throat> so let's say I have a contract that only has one storage slot. Uh, the proof that would need to be included for this one storage slot is quite small. You just need one leaf. Um, but on the other hand, I have a contract that has a million storage slots, which means a tree of depth, I don't know, ten, uh, a large tree. And so each time that contract does a S load, uh, uh, a large proof would have to be included. Um, so this is an alternative way of pricing. But this would kind of discourage um, big storage for contracts. Like contracts that have a big storage would have to pay more for, for storage. Um, it's also very hard to estimate because um, you can estimate uh, for like any time like an S load opcode is executed. But on the other hand, at the end of the block, we are kind of aggregating these proofs together, which we get some saving from. So it's hard to estimate at the time of execution how much uh, this, this S load will actually add to, to the block data. So we have these two uh, approaches to, um, to storage um, opcodes. And then we have the contract code. So anytime you do a, a call or an X code hash or something, um, the code for the whole contract that you're calling has to be included in the, in the block, which, which can be quite a lot. Like if you imagine the limit for contract size is 24 kilobytes right now. So I can, I can create a, a, um, like a contract that does thousands of calls. And this would mean that I, um, that I can, I think Vitalik, in, in, in his post, Vitalik estimated that you, could, you can craft a transaction that induces a block size of 300 megabytes, which is quite a lot. Like, we don't want that. So uh, one option is to charge gas for every byte of contract code. Like if, you, if you're calling a contract that has 100, 100 bytes, you would pay 300 um, gas for it. If it's a contract that has 24 kilobytes, then you would have to pay 72,000 uh, 72, gas for calling that contract. So depending on the size of the contract that you're calling, you would have to pay more. The other approach is to go down the Merkleization route um, so we, we as, as I said before, we create, we divide contracts into chunks, merkleize it, uh, so forth, and then, then you would have to only pay for those parts of the code that were accessed during the trans transaction. So this would probably be cheaper, but it's also more complicated approach. Um, yeah, as I said, so these are things that you shouldn't be assuming when you're uh, writing a smart contract. You shouldn't assume the prices of opcodes uh, because these prices can change and they could therefore um, possibly break your contracts, make them more expensive. Um, you shouldn't rely that at all. At all. Like try to um, not assume any, any gas prices. Uh, the other thing is like you shouldn't, for now, you shouldn't assume a tree structure. Like if, for example, if you are doing uh, Merkle proof verification inside the inside a contract, um, uh, that, could, that assumption could break when we change the tree structure. Um, and, and sometimes some of the dApps use um, receipts and logs to, as a way of storing things. Um, this could also, like this is also something that you cannot rely on because I wouldn't be surprised if in a few months client uh, start pruning old logs and old receipts so that the user cannot access them. And this is something that I want to encourage. Like, uh, uh, it would be nice to see more experimentation on. Um, so what we've been so far discussing is stateless clients. But this is a similar approach, but it's, we call them stateless contracts. So even before Ethereum itself becomes stateless, you can write stateless contracts. And they would be like, you have a contract that doesn't store anything but a 32-byte hash. 
And this hash would be the root of a tree, which you are storing off-chain, not in the contract itself. And every time that you, uh, like a user sends a transaction, you send all of the Merkle proofs necessary, all of the parts of the tree necessary for that transaction uh, with it. So let's say you, have a, you wanna develop a stateless token. You store the root of, like you have a tree of uh, accounts. In the leaves of the tree, you have uh, balances of the accounts. Um, you only store the root on chain in the contract and every time you want to do a transfer from user A to user B, you include in the transaction, you include the accounts for A and B and the Merkle proofs for A and B and the contract can verify the proof and then do the transfer um, and that's it. And this, this is kind of, um, I, I wrote here future proof because it doesn't use the, the default mechanism that Ethereum provides for storage. So even if uh, upcode prices are increased, uh, you won't be affected by it by much because you're only storing one item um, in, in the contract. And you probably won't be making assumptions about gas um, and so on. So, I mean, you can, you can think that Z, uh, ZK rollup and similar contracts they are stateless contracts. Like ZK rollup only stores uh, one root, but does um, the only difference to what I'm saying would be that they are doing all of this proof verification and transfer by, uh, by um, zero knowledge proofs. But but you don't need the zero knowledge proof really. And and something that could help with with this approach is, I, I know some people like Guillaume Ballet and, and John Adler, they are working on pre-compiles for proof verification. And if these pre-compiles come, then you might be able to do this even for cheaper uh, today. So yeah, in short, um, storage prices will probably increase. Um, it's not clear how much or how exactly it could be a static increase in, in gas, or it could be based on how large your storage is. Uh, you shouldn't make assumptions about gas. Uh, you shouldn't um, rely on, on logs. And you should check out status contracts. Um, thank you, and are there any questions? Hey, thank you so much. That was a great, great summary. I, unfortunately, I missed like following up on the whole topic more than I probably should have. So I got a ton of questions, and maybe they're stupid. <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> sure, go ahead. So I, I, sorry, um, I have to say that I just wanted to like in the beginning parts, I kind of gave only a short summary of what stateless Ethereum is all about. Because if you're going to ECC, you will probably hear about it a lot. I like I just wanted to focus on the later part, which is how it affects you. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you talked about the witness that I need to transmit with every transaction, that basically my transaction becomes the whole witness and like the actual thing that that I want to do. Yeah. So in the ex examples of like the pricing, wouldn't it is has it been considered that just the size of the witness would be the uh, somehow impacting the price? Because that seems like the the clearest one to me. If the your goal is to keep the block size at a certain limit. Yeah, that's uh, that's here. Um the, the second approach, like what I call witness size sensitive pricing. It's basically yeah, to, to see uh, how large the witness is and charge based on that. But, but the problem is that you cannot estimate exactly, like when you're uh, executing the transaction, let's say you're, you're running EVM bytecodes, <laughs> uh, like when you reach a S load, at, at that point you won't know how many other um, Merkle proofs would have to be included because the thing is like you can you can estimate the price of one Merkle branch, but at the end of the block, we are all merging all of these into one big proof uh, like this one. So you would get quite a lot of saving. And we, like this only, we, we know the exact size only at the end of the block, not during the ex execution of a transaction. So we can only do a very conservative estimate. And that means that the the gas cost would be much higher than than necessary. Uh, that, that brings me directly to my second question: Is how do I create that witness? Because if I now want to send a transaction from my wallet, right, 
I need to create that witness locally, I guess. Uh, no, no. So this is like with the stateless client uh, approach, you don't need to do that. This is, you just send a transaction. Um, the miner pick, will pick it up. And the miner will include all of, like, when the miner wants to uh, make a block out of all these transactions in the pool, it will also add the, the witness to the block itself. So users won't need to directly send, uh, include the proofs. I mean, that's okay. They might need to include parts of the proof, uh, parts of the witness. That's, that's still being discussed. But the majority of the witness will be the responsibility of the miner. So, or, or the, so how does that make the miner stateless? Like I thought that. No, no, no. The, the miners will be stateful. Uh, I, I should have made this clear. Miners will be stateful. It's just that you add a new class of clients that are fully so they are different from light clients in that they can fully execute or fully verify the chain. They can start verifying from the genesis, and they will they will receive a block with its full witness, um, verify it, go to the next block, and so on. Uh, but these are a new kind of entity. These are new kind of nodes that don't have high storage requirements. And we expect that like, we will have miners that are stateful. And then you would have a lot of user, end user nodes that we don't have now, because users are now relying on Infura. But instead of Infura, you could run a stateless client, which, has, which can process blocks fast and don't, doesn't have a high storage requirement. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so miners would be stateful. Oh, th th this is great. I, uh, thank you for, for that information. Yeah. Um, so, can I just follow up with one more stupid question there? Like, yeah, sure. if, if I run then this new type of client that is not doesn't have the full state, then I can't even use that to create a witness for my transaction, right? So, I still have to know somebody like Infura who yeah. actually has the full information, and I still yeah. So, on them. so then um, this is again what like um, I, I want to stress that again. These are all. Um, in discussion, like it's not. Uh, I don't want to uh, say that this these are all clear at all or something. But so it will be the network structure would have to change, and the the stateless clients would um, store parts of the state that they care about. Like if I if I'm an end user, I will I would hold my uh, my own account or all of my accounts in in my storage and the contracts that I mo um, like most likely will interact with. And any time that I'm missing part of the stick, like let's say I want to um, interact with a new uh, contract that I haven't interacted with before, then I ask the network, uh, okay, what's this part? So this part would be interactive. Like I ask some, some of my peers, uh, does anyone have this part of the state? Um, I get it with the proof. I have it now locally, and then, uh, but again, so, so the end user wouldn't need to include the witness. So they, they, don't, they, they only need this part of the state to be able to know, OK, what is my balance? What is this friend's balance? How can I? But they, they wouldn't really need to, need to make the witness themselves, apart from their own balance. Like they, they need to prove their own balance so that uh, the, client, the other clients in the network can verify that they can pay gas. Okay, thank you. I thank you so that much. Like, <laughs> very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Sina, for awesome talk. Um,